As we traced our ancestral lineage through this cladogram in the first half dozen episodes of the series, we learned that you are, among other things, a eukaryote because you have nucleated cells. You're unicont because your gamete cells have a single flagella, and you're episcotont because that flagella pushes from behind. You're an animal because you're multicellular with an internal digestive tract. You're a bilaterally symmetrical triploblast having three germ layers. You're a nephrozoan because those germ layers connect a digestive tract from a mouth at one end to an anus at the other. And you're deuterostome because the embryo develops the anus first and then invaginates that cavity through to the other end to the mouth. However, evolution isn't always a linear progression. For example, if we look in the sister clade of proterostomes, we find some platyhelminths, also known as flatworms, have simplified or reverted and have secondarily lost their coelom and anus. We can often tell when this sort of thing happens because the genome still places this organism at this part of the tree despite the loss of certain physical traits, and very often the loss of those traits is indicated in the genome too. For example, some deuterostomes inherit hemoglobin, while chelicerates and mollusks, both protostomes, inherit hemocyanin. That means that this branch leads to red blood and this branch leads to blue blood. And one exception to this is a particular family of snails that has red blood. Molecular studies showed that the hemocyanin ancestry is genetically there, but it's disabled, forcing an alteration of a new form of hemoglobin that was subsequently derived from myoglobin. And likewise, back in deuterostomes, we saw that echinoderms started out as bilaterally symmetrical animals, but then something happens in their development that seems to change their symmetry, or at least their polarity. Each of these peculiarities illustrate why the only consistent means of classification of organisms is monophyletic, meaning that each clade includes all its descendants without eliminating certain ones that don't have the traits of that clade anymore. While physical characteristics may be used as indicators, the organism is ultimately classified according to its evident evolutionary ancestry. On that note, staying within deuterostomes from here on, we look at another sister clade, Hemichordata. These odd-looking worms show the first emergence of a few important traits. First, we see this wide space in the circulatory system which contracts, pumping blood cells into circulation in a way that more primitive animals don't do at all. This is obviously a very simple heart. It doesn't have the chambers or other features of more modern hearts, but that's obviously what it is. Remember that evolution at every level is usually just a subtle change in physical or chemical proportions, just like this vein widening to become a heart. Every organ began just as simply as this. Another example from the same clade is that some hemichordates are pharyngeal feeders. This means they take food into their mouths and filter it through delicate pharyngeal slits behind where their jaws would be if they had jaws. A Hox mutation on a bilaterally symmetrical animal can cause a trait to be mirrored on either side. Hernial orifices are common mutations, but they're only very rarely are they useful. In this case, they were apparently adapted from originally filtering tiny particles of food to filtering oxygen too, subsequently becoming useful as gills. Another important emerging feature in hemichordates is the one they were named for. In addition to the trunk nerve cord, homologous with the spinal cord in more advanced animals, they also have a sort of notochord, a hollow tube of cartilage supporting the body along the oral to anal axis. This flexible rod helps fish to swim and also supports the developing embryos in so-called higher animals. The name hemichordata means half cord because there's a similar to, but not quite, an actual notochord. There are hemichordates in the fossil record in the lower or middle Cambrian, pretty much where you'd expect them to be for you know, part of our evolution. Consequently, hemichordates are often considered to be the most primitive form of chordate, or rather protochordate, because you know they're not quite there yet. That, of course, leads us to the next important clade in your ancestry, chordata, being animals with this dorsal nerve canal leading to a spinal cord. As we mentioned in an earlier episode, those who really don't want to understand evolution because they don't want to believe it often say that every kind of life, every major phylum we have today, appeared all at once in a biological proliferation known as the Cambrian Explosion. But if you've been watching this series, you know of at least one phylum that was already extinct before the Cambrian began and another that didn't appear until after everything else. But otherwise, yeah, every other phylum. But what does that mean in our case? Because while biologists know of a lot more diverse and primitive forms, if you ask any layman to list how many animals they can think of in a minute, chances are that all of them, whether they're mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, or fish, will be chordates. Probably every animal they can think of in that moment. But all those hugely diverse taxonomic classes of chordates are represented by a single common ancestor that doesn't appear until late in the Cambrian, about 505 million years ago. 
The earliest chordates have been identified from a rare cache of soft-bodied Cambrian and Ordovician fossils in Canada's Burgess Shale. These were little more than swimming worms, but deuterostomes with a notochord and pharyngeal gills. Some even had teeth, pretty serious ones too, even though they have as yet no jaws, nor bones in which to mount jaws. And one particular specimen called Picaya is considered to be the oldest example of a true chordate. It's sort of a slender slug with an elaborate body length fin for swimming and a definite indication of a spinal cord even though it didn't yet have a spine to keep it in. These then were arguably the earliest, simplest, and most primitive form of fish. Although many people insist that fish are vertebrates, not everything universally accepted as a fish has vertebrae. Lancelets, lampreys, and hagfish don't, for example. And that's just part of the problem with the word fish. It doesn't have any value in taxonomic classification, partly because that word is, has no consistent definition in cladistics, and partly because the colloquial understanding of that word is exclusively paraphyletic, distinguishing them from other chordates only by traits that are secondarily lost. If we accept lancelets and lampreys as fish, as some people do, then we should say chordates instead. In a monophyletic classification of life forms, there are two seemingly equally ridiculous options. Either there's no such thing as a fish in cladistic phylogenetics, or every chordate and everything that was ever descended from a chordate is still a fish, including you. But regardless what a biologist or a boatman thinks that a fish is, the question is, because human fetal development includes a stage with pharyngeal arches and a notochord leading to a spinal cord, do you accept your classification in the phylum chordata?